Welcome to today's show with five steps towards successfully breastfeeding. Now, I am Chelsea Curley. I'm here in the UK and I'm joined, of course, by the very special Dr. Robin Thompson, who's going to reveal some key things to consider in your preparation for planning to breastfeed. Because, of course, many of us prepare for our births, understandably, especially if you're a first time mum, I did the same. But we also do, we're commonly neglecting planning for breastfeeding and we are hoping that it just comes naturally to us, which is a way to um, not necessarily avoid the common complications that Dr. Robin will talk a little bit more about later. So thank you again for your time, Dr. Robin. She's a very busy lady, this one. <laughs> My pleasure. Absolute pleasure. <laughs> of course, always, always. And for those watching, if you are watching here on Facebook Live or watching later back on YouTube, please do like and share and subscribe so that we can reach as many women as possible. That is our goal. So we're going to get straight in with step number one today, which is our favourite. I think you'd agree, Dr. Robin, which is preparation and education. Don't leave it to chance. What do you think about that, Dr. Robin? No, but, and many women feed that back to me. They wish they had have done the preparation. So I do get that feedback quite often. Uh, well, a lot, really, from, from women. So um, pre it, it, it all depends on choice, of course. If women choose to breastfeed and they would like to, it's, it's really advisable and it's a real benefit to be prepared and to have some knowledge about what it is you would like to do and to avoid um, complications. So the education has a, a great component of avoiding complications. It helps you think about all those things. Oh, that's so true. And yeah. obviously with, with education, with knowledge, comes power and confidence, I think, in making informed decisions. Without doubt, without doubt, so many women are coerced into things that they do not want to do or they had not planned to do and the coercion is just running rife at the moment. Mm. Oh. Everywhere that I'm talking with women around the world, there is coercion happening. So it's very important not to be fearful by people coercing you when your instincts are telling you something different. Mm. And I prefer women to follow their instincts because I believe that will not be wrong. Nobody knows your instinctive knowledge or your self-knowledge. So preparing, and, and, and writing what you would like to happen and, and developing that over time is really good. And, and having information and education that helps you um, understand how milk production is made and how to avoid the most common problem, which is nipple trauma. Absolutely. I mean, you smashed so much into such a short sentence there perfectly. And it's, it's so true. And when you mention the coercion, I mean, I can certainly speak from personal experience that I may not have experienced much um, fear induced decision making during my pregnancy. However, as soon as my son arrived, Jacob, two years ago, um, the fear was the, the fear kicked in. It almost overshadows your natural instincts as well, because yeah. you're being told all this information. It's all mm -hmm. conflicting, which overwhelms you, and confuses you mm -hmm. anyway. How are, you, how are you going to make a decision on that without your own knowledge to, to back that up, you know? So I think yeah. that is one of the most important. I'm just going to share on the screen a little um, a little stat at the bottom. So I hope you, you, you ladies, you guys can see that. And it says only 15.4% of Australian women breastfeed up to five months. And in the UK, it's actually around 1% which is clearly um, way lower than the health organized, the World Health Organization recommended six months. And from Dr. Robin's research, which I will link below in the comments, um, you, you'll see that actually it's, it's quite a drop, a dramatic drop, um, I think you'll agree, Dr. Robin, in those early weeks as well, where formula are introduced or bottles or pumping, expressing with an electronic pump. So many um, things are introduced, which can really affect the journey definitely affect the journey it alters the um the biorhythmical function of the mother and her baby together and so all the different things that you do to your body changes how your body produces breast milk and then it has the increased risk of running into other complications as well so the more that you like women of the past have done breastfeed your baby um, in the way that you know the education is really about understanding how it all works 
-hmm. And then once you understand that, it'll make sense and it makes mm -hmm. it really easy about mm -hmm. how breast milk production actually works and how your biorhythmical function and your pituitary gland functions with you in a beautiful cycle and a wonderful rhythm as well. That's so very true. And mm -hmm. and to add to add to that, because I was one of those that I thought, actually I thought I had prepared for breastfeeding, but I think it's worth saying that the the information, the education that is actually out there is so super duper outdated. It's conflicting, like I just said, and and actually it's it's very forceful. So many women I hear from, I'm sure that you do as well, Dr. Robin, especially based on your research, the, the statistics aren't matching. World breastfeeding rates are scarily low, especially in times we're in unprecedented times right now, where women are really wanting to breastfeed mm. and they're being forced to stop with, with things that could have been avoided with the right education. Mm. Right. And this leads us into the next magical point, which was developed and it's one of the key principles of the Thompson Method and it is the three golden hours. So I know that you taught me this and I didn't know this with Jacob, but if a baby's APGAR score is seven or above, baby belongs in your arms. Tell us how we know this. Why don't we get told this? Uh, that's, I don't know why that's not shared with you, but the APGAR score is a score that the professionals do um, at one minute, five minutes and ten minutes. And when the APGAR score is above seven, then the baby is fine, unless there's a secondary complication of any sort and uh, that's not common when a baby has an APGAR score of seven so they're ready to be with their mother in fact I believe every baby even preemie babies should be with their mother as quickly as possible and if not if at all possible not separated only if it's absolutely necessary there is a, quite a lot of ev evidence coming now about, and there's, I've actually looked at a couple of papers, I haven't read them in detail, but I have briefed them, uh, that there is a move towards uh, even prem babies coming to their mothers. So, uh, you, you know, the, the little baby does have to smell you, does have to feel confident, does have to know you're there. And what we do when we separate you is we create stress and other people's smells and other people's handling is different to yours. You'll be much more gentle with your baby than someone else will be. And your baby's just come from within you. So your baby needs to be on your body at the time on earth as well. Yes, and it, does, it does make so much sense. And here in the UK, um, I'm quite proud to say that we have a few leading um, hospitals, NICU centres, which are, are very well known for their premature care. And um, sure. they, they talk very openly and they promote the, the early um, carrying and cuddling with mum and dad and, and whoever's there looking after baby. And I just want to interrupt our session just to respond to Amy. Will this session be available to watch later? Yes, Amy, it is. It's going to be available on Dr. Robin's page for you to watch whenever you like. So I hope, hope that was helpful. So um, Dr. Robin, um, something that's always fascinated me is um, another key principle, which is included in those three golden hours, because you tell us and you inform us and you encourage us to protect this special time. And I suppose one of the ways we could do this is avoiding unnecessary interventions until that first breastfeed is complete. I mean, there's so many barriers for us nowadays, isn't there with that? But give us a tip. What can we do to... to At our score of seven, baby stays with mother and baby feeds when the baby wants to leisurely for the first up to three hours. Sometimes they take a half an hour to get to find their way to the breast. Uh, sometimes they might take an hour. It depends on the story that's gone before that. And if there's been opiates involved in the care, because the babies can often be sleepy from that. But the three golden hours is important to transfer of the mother's colostrum and when we say the mother's colostrum, it is species specific for your baby. And it's really important that it's transferred in, in, in reasonable time after the baby's born to start preparing the baby's gut. In. And it's so, so, so important that other milks are not offered to the baby, particularly in that early time, but also um, it's, it's very important that the colostrum transfers. Very this, this I found incredibly fascinating, um, especially mm -hmm. going through the academy, which is um, the Thompson Method Breastfeeding Academy. 
and um, the higher education that the Thompson Method now provides. And I was just blown away when I did my own research aside um, on the rates in some countries in the world where non-human milk is introduced in those early days as, as policy, as hospital policy, because they believe or they are informing women that actually you need to supplement in those first few days. And if you don't choose to supplement, you need to express your breasts. Now, there's a wealth of information on this in the online education, and you do go into huge detail on this. I know we don't have time to cover mm. that today. I just wanted to to mention it because I think it's food for thought. Like you say, there mm. are practices and policies mm. out there that may not be in the best interests of mum and baby, right? Yeah. So in my years of observation of mothers and babies closely, they they achieve the first three hours roughly. It doesn't have to be absolute, but it's a roughly around that time. And also, as I said, it depends on the circumstances leading up to, to it. But also the baby has a rest, the mother has a little rest, and uh, you know, then the baby comes back and feeds frequently. And they feed frequently for a purpose, and that's to increase milk volume over the first three to four days. Mm -hmm. And they, they need to do that to stimulate the biophysiological function of the pituitary gland to release the hormones. And that's very important and that gets cut short so many times it gets interrupted to do all sorts of things on the baby. If the baby is a healthy well baby, nothing needs to be done, not even weighing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that is one of those unnecessary interventions, including yeah. a few others which you can learn about when I pop some useful blogs below. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, wish and I it is that. very important that no one takes your baby away from you unless you feel it is absolutely necessary. This is your baby. I've, your I've had stories baby. about um, women giving birth. They have a cuddle, which isn't really a cuddle in my opinion. It's, it's more someone holding baby onto you. Uh, you can hold your baby for a second. I'm just going to take them away and bath them. They're going to bath yeah. them in their first minutes of life. You don't, bath and, you don't bath a new baby because it removes all the beautiful bacterial contact that, that, that the mother and the baby have together. It's it's worse if it goes to someone else rather than to the mother. Yeah. This baby needs to be on the skin to start building up its own little external immune system. It has a good immune system from the placental function. Yeah, so we're already throwing so much at you. So we hope we hope you're finding it useful. And um, the reason I changed topic in between there is because we were we were touching upon um, understanding how your body works to produce that precious liquid gold. Now, yeah. as as Dr. Robin said just then, those three golden hours are crucial for for the introduction for the establishment of breastfeeding. But they're not necessary all the time. If you are separated. There's, there's lots of things that you can do in preparation or having mm. that knowledge to know what to do if uh, unforeseen circumstances do arise. Um, so, yes, yes, get in touch with us if you have any questions. Yeah, and the baby can still have your breast milk in that time, your colostrum in that time. And, Absolutely. And part of my role is to, um, you know, encourage mothers to be aware of all of that and how they can work mm. that. I suppose this takes us back to the first point, doesn't it, really, Dr. Robin, about having that knowledge and having mm. that power and then that confidence to make informed yes. decisions, which you won't be able to do without the knowledge because, of course, it's easy to pass on that decision-making when you're in a vulnerable position. Yeah, that's right. There's a lot of information about weight as well because there's so much pressure on mothers and babies normally lose weight in those first three days. And it's, it's surprising how... Um, <laughs> how different and how how much the rules vary in different countries i know here in the uk i think you have around two two to three weeks to to, to not lose to over 10 percent of body weight which i think is pretty fair really um but in the us i think some some women have told me they have to pick up babies they have to get back to birth weight before they are discharged from hospital which no is, that's not possible for every it's baby. not possible They're for my son anyway <laughs> babies are genetically unique and so when they're genetically unique, they are not going to do the same thing as every other baby on the graph on the planet. They will do what is, some babies grow tall and slim, start off, they grow and they don't put on weight. They're not there to be fattened up as the language is here. Yes, we want well, that, if I hadn't known that, if I hadn't have spoken to you, I think Jacob was around five or six weeks, I would have been so petrified because that is yeah. that is exactly what Jacob was like. And I know so many other 
women and babies as well that are like that. We're yeah. all unique as as are our babies, and our breast milk is perfect. And um, and I have worked with two little one point eight kilo babies that only breastfeed. So yeah. wow. it's not impossible. It's just the patience and the time that you have with that wonderful mother to help her achieve what she needs to achieve with that minimum minimum of fear and the minimum of intervention of any sort. Yeah. yeah, so true. Then the magic happens. And I actually found I found a quote from you, and um, this is probably one from our lovely Marie as well. There is no magic milk making cookie. <laughs> no. So women do do um, uh, buy cookies. You can buy them in all sorts of places here. But the real way that milk is produced is by the mother and the baby and how the baby is feeding at the breast. That's how it's made. Unless there's a complication where a mother might have an abnormality of a breast or there's something different that that's not, you know, not just settling into. And usually in my practice, we will talk about that and work with that in pregnancy. So it's very important for, for anybody who has any concerns to work with it in pregnancy, not when the mm. baby's and born. And this it keeps taking us back to that original point of preparation, education, yeah. and pregnancy, yeah. because if you don't understand the key principles of how breast milk production works and how yeah. your body works, you individually work to produce that breast milk, yes. then how are you going to feel confident in your yeah. body doing its job? How are you going to know how much or all those other yeah. questions I remember having and and knowing, actually understanding how and and knowing how your baby looks when they're satisfied, to know they've got and enough. Also, yeah, and also understanding that there are times when the milk, a platter, when the baby plateaus, the milk volume comes down. When the baby grow, on the growth spurt, the milk volume goes up because the baby creates that. Yeah, I mean, there's so, just so much. To yeah, do. there's yeah. lots and lots to cover. And, you know, the, the women of the past, they didn't have cookies made for them and they were feeding their babies even when they were travelling. So I think I think we've gone a little bit too far and also anti-nausea drugs to increase milk volume. When we There are so it. many marketed products. There are drinks, yeah, yeah. there are vitamins, there are cookies and recipes. I mean, the, the internet is bombarded with cookies and recipes and all sorts right now because of the very unfortunate situation in America where where mums aren't able to purchase formula or certain types of formula, which I do believe the situation is improving. And we send you lots of um, love and hugs if you're in that situation. We can't even imagine what that must be like for you. Dr. Robin has been working tirelessly this week to film some education and some resources on this. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, the, 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 the marketed products are just that, aren't they? They are marketed products. Mm -hmm. They are there to make money and yeah, there's a big money money shame. involved in all of this sort of thing and especially in these times when there's there's a situation where mothers are, are stressed and distressed and and also the big problem with social media conflicting confusing information so coming back to your maternal instincts will never be wrong it'll always be right but when you're tired when you're overwhelmed by a whole lot of things, it's really hard for your instincts. They become a bit suppressed, but then take a big breath and come back to your maternal instincts. Nobody knows you or your baby like you do. No one. Very true. And actually, um, I didn't join the Thompson Method, the program, until Jacob was around six weeks. And that is one of my only regrets, really. In motherhood is not not having that access to that during pregnancy to ask all the questions that I had um, that I was getting a thousand different answers to yeah. but actually it, when you are in that moment like you just described where you're feeling a little bit vulnerable and I'm sure you think you know the answer but you just need a little bit of reassurance these women our, our, our lovely community are able to pop that question up and just yeah. be gently reminded that actually they know best here are, here are a few resources um, to help guide you if you need the support and guidance it's there so I think yeah, I think that's a very good point. And, and actually, if anyone watching would like to learn more about Dr. Robin's online education, just comment yes below and I will personally get in touch with you um, once the session is over. Kiri and Samantha have some questions that I will be answering shortly as well. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the time in the session today to do it, but I will certainly share some info with you very shortly. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. So the next point is... Uh, one that we know you feel very passionately about which is number four which is hospital policy is not law 
understanding enough. your rights. Why is that important? Yes, that's my presentation, the isation syndrome, because the institutionalisation creates enormous problems. Um, and, and, you know, part of that is you become a victim of the system and that systemization and also um, everything else that goes on in the system, policies. We have policies. Policy is not legislated. It's, it's something that the system wants you to do so they can process you quicker through the system. And also, it does affect my colleagues too. It, it's, it, they can't perform in the way that their duty of care is, is, is to guide them. And, and it's very hard to be responsible and accountable in, in a systemization where uh, the mother's under control to be in through and out of the system. And also where there's no time to sit and listen to what she says, to observe her, to watch her facial expressions, to understand her as a unique mother, not one of the population. Following a chart, <laughs> mm. which seems to be the thing. And I think um, we could probably give some examples here. Um, declining induction or declining a recommendation, vaginal examination. Talk a little bit more about... Well, I think it's best to watch my video, please keep your fingers out of my vagina. Absolutely. Yes, I will so, share that below. Because and please, keep, do your, go. And please mm. keep your digit out of my anus. Yes, so, which is a new one that you told me about recently. Well, it was around 50 years ago and then it stopped and now they re, have reintroduced it and it's called, uh, it's part of the, the process that's called the bundle and no one should put their digit in your anus. If they want to have a good look at your perineum for a particular good reason, then they should do that with good light in, in, in the place that's appropriate. So it might be where you are in the labour ward. It might also be in the operating room to go under the proper lights and have a look so yes. it's all over the more and always device. always consented to we're hearing some truly yeah. shocking stories about women um being examined or having yeah. um processes done to them without the permission without their consent yeah. and all the technology that's being used and that creates fear as well and technology is not accurate and, and the the broad uh, approach to it is like you've got this graph and you have to follow this graph everybody's the same and then the coercion starts even there so uh, you know again ultrasound has been questioned for a long long time yeah yeah that's, and, that's and stay in control stay strong know yourself <laughs> and which and, is easier with with education yeah. behind you of course and, and a couple of the other another thing that, that i learned <laughs> from you yes <laughs> Which is funny, we have to be reminded, really, isn't it? It is our baby. Yeah. We are allowed to make a decision. But that, yeah. that is right. And we can ask why. What is your reason for this recommendation? Yes or no, I do or don't agree with this recommendation. Can I take some time to go research this recommendation? And, of course, you're allowed to ask for a second opinion. And all this stuff seems very simple. But actually, I, I, didn't, I didn't follow this or even That's understand. the law of consent. The law of consent is legislated. So no one can do anything to you unless it's an absolute emergency where the senior obstetrician will make the decisions, but you have the right. And, and it's when you know your rights, it makes it quite easy for you to have a conversation and say, yes, look, when I've had time to have a look at this, I will come back and talk with you. And I, t I don't talk about talking to you because two is too um, controlling. I'm talking with you. And we're listening to each other and we are, we, we're, we're, we're having a conversation that gives information both ways and reassurance too. And it just makes all the world of difference. Language yeah. is another very important factor, a very important mm -hmm. part of the education in the academy. I'm sure all our wonderful educators and practitioners that are almost qualified, they're almost at the end of their very special journey. Um, they have learned a lot, um, not only through empowering education and research, yeah. but just understanding the importance of language and how yeah. to be beside women rather than over them, which I've learned. And, and if class. someone is standing over you, dominating you, you can ask them to pull up a chair and sit down, please, mm. so, oh, that I yeah. can, so that I can have eye contact with you. And if you can't do that, your midwife should do that for you because, yes. or your advocate, whoever it is, because I've done that many times in my career. Dominance is not healthy for any mother 
with what part, it doesn't matter what part of her pregnancy, labour or birth she's in or breastfeeding, it should not be a dominant approach. Yeah, for sure. I hope that um, I hope that many women get to see that because it's a very important message. So our final step today, um, and it's a very important one, especially for me personally, because I did suffer with such extraordinary nipple pain and trauma. Number five, avoiding forceful techniques. So, Dr. Robin, talk about this is the basis of your PhD research, isn't it? This is the foundation yes. of the topic. Yes. Tell us why you decided to research. Um, I decided to, to research because of the number of women that I was seeing with breastfeeding complications, in particular nipple trauma, soon after hospital discharge. So I had to ask the question of why. I wanted to know why. And I'm one of those people that I'm not satisfied till I do know why. And, you know, the, the evidence was in my, my data and that for the last 50 years, breastfeeding has been taught to be forceful roughly 50 years now and it's not meant to be forceful no little baby is meant to be handled forcefully no mother's breast is meant to be held like a hamburger no baby is meant to be thrust to the breast that's not how the highly sensitive newborn locates and knows what to do and, and, and it's so ingrained topic. in um, our professionals' training now that yes. many professionals that come across your research, many that we find in the academy, in the club, sometimes even in our free groups as well, they just say, but how do you expect a baby to find the breast naturally? And it always amazes me. It makes well, me smile, that question, because that's how ingrained of, it is. I did a lot of research also on other mammals and what they do, the breastfeeding, milk-producing breastfeeding mammals. And they don't force their babies to their teats or their breast. They The babies locate and you can see that happening all the time. The only time there's intervention and interruption and handling of newborn babies and uh, and um, uh, yeah, interventions lots mm. is in the zoo. Now. That's very true. <laughs> I haven't considered that. That's very true. You do sometimes feel like you're in a zoo as a mum though, don't you? Especially... As a first-time yeah. mum with a newborn, it's just such yeah. an incredibly over, overwhelming And situation. I watch many beautiful creatures feeding the, the young, even the bat up in the top of the tree, the, yes. the fruit bat. And it was <laughs> amazing watching what how they went about looking after their baby and, and um, you know, the, the female bat supporting her. And, you know, I could tell you a whole lot of stories. I have many stories. <laughs> you do. And you're constantly yeah. learning as well. So there's always yeah. something new and you're always expanding yeah. knowledge. So like you, if, if you'd yeah. like to learn more about um, what Dr. Robin did find in her research and um, the actual research itself, there's a science behind the Thompson Method. It is it's so much more than just a technique, but it is evidence-based and proven to help women enjoy their birth and breastfeeding experiences. So do let me know if you'd like to, to know more. And I'm sharing below, <clears throat> running across the screen, excuse me, uh, a blog post right now, um, planning to breastfeed, read this. Um, this is the basics um, of what, what to consider as well. Um, very much similar to what we're covering today, but there's a lot of really helpful information there and also does talk about the forceful techniques as well. And when we say forceful techniques, we should probably be a little bit more specific. Um, one, one of the techniques in your research, Dr. Roman, was the cross cradle, is that right? The cross cradle and where the baby's held by the craniocervical spine, which is so close to oral cavity function. And then the mother's breast is grabbed and then the baby shoved on the breast. This is the best way. Well, in my experience, it's not. This is the reason that so many women have particularly nipple tip trauma. And that was, that was significant in my research. And I could see the behaviours of the baby when they were being held and then slammed to the breast. And the behaviour was uh, like a, I actually rang a guy who was specialised in whiplash. It was reminding me a whiplash because the babies were reacting with their craniocervical spine, which is normal. If, if you understand the function of the craniocervical spine and the small brain it, at the base of the skull here and what that small brain is doing with the, the newborn, it does it with all of us, let alone the newborn. Well, it actually, it actually gives me a bit, of, a bit of memory trauma because I just, it didn't feel right for me. It's such an uncomfortable position. No. You don't know. You're yeah. always told you're doing it wrong. You spend hours and hours perfecting this 
ridiculous hold and then um you go to seek help because it's still hurting and you're told you're doing it wrong and then oh let's introduce another hold and another hold and mouth wide open and all these checklist jobs you have to do so well, so please please do do your research and um, yeah. discover more of the thompson method and and understand how a baby's body works as well dr robin has done extensive research into the and how the, baby's brain, how the baby's brain functions in these um circumstances where the baby coordinates what it needs to do using the small brain same as we all do yeah, so coordination sure. the baby knows what to do and if we if we give the mother space and time and we can enjoy so much by just watching carefully yes it's yes. so very beautifully so, said and i think yeah. Although this isn't in our five steps, I think the most important point to remember is be guided by your beautiful maternal instincts. Of course, this comes with confidence, which comes with knowledge and education. But as much as you can, do be guided by your beautiful maternal instincts. Yeah. And to all those beautiful women that are going to do this, I really, really encourage you to, you know, understand yourself and your baby. You will be unique. Every mother, every baby on the planet is unique. In fact, every person on the planet is unique. We are gen genetically unique. We are biophysiologically unique. We are anatomically unique. We are neurologically and psychologically unique. So there's no two people the same. Even identity. And you never slip up with any errors when you say that, but you always yeah. say it with such precision. But it's so true. Yeah. And I wish I had known this yeah. so much that I know now I had wish I knew back then. And I'm sure I could say the same in a few more years as well. We're always forever learning, aren't we? I must say, I knew none of this when I had my own babies and I breastfed my babies. We just did it, you know, mm -hmm. and we didn't have the complications. Well, I'm not aware of having the complications that. I guess uh, you didn't have the level of interventions and forceful techniques either, though. No, no. And the rapid you know, process of the hospital system, you know, of course. Mothers, mothers and babies are meant to be together and they're meant to be close with each other because every sensory skill in their body is alert for survival. That's what well, I think that is a very wonderful end yeah. a message for today's show and um those five five, five steps towards um successfully breastfeeding um should yes. give you the crux of the beginning to go away take some time to consider those things and do get in touch we love hearing from you and like i said earlier whether you're watching on facebook live or you're watching the replay later on youtube do give us a like and share so that we can reach as many women as many fathers mothers friends family members as possible um to share our aim is to share as much knowledge with as many people as possible so thank you so much for watching dr robin our very special lady thank Thank you so much for your time, your research thank and you. your education. And thank women you to always. all those wonderful women and their babies. Thank you. Thank you. Well, best wishes, everyone. And do stay safe. Take care. We'll see you next week.